spies and assassins in fiction through the ages. So the fundamental question at the heart of this talk today is why are we so gripped by spy fiction? Why does it have this enduring appeal? And I'm also going to pose the questions, how has it changed across the ages and in which ways has it stayed the same? And crucially as well, I want to ask, what does it potentially tell us about ourselves and society? So what do we think of when we imagine the classic spy? Well, probably something like this. Um, so the, the posh, uh, old Etonian, Oxbridge-educated, straight white man, James Bond, or Boris Johnson's cabinet, I imagine, as well. Um, <laughs> But now Killing Eve is on the scene, and it looks like uh, spy fiction has fundamentally changed. Killing Eve is very much, um, well, it seems to be subverting classic spy stereotypes. So in the opening, we see a woman, for those of you who don't know, uh, we see a woman sitting in a cafe smiling at a child, apparently a kind of maternal figure. Cut to London, and we see another woman in bed with a man. So apparently we have a kind of maternal figure and a lover figure. But of course, both of these stereotypes are immediately smashed. The woman in the cafe stands up, walks past the child, and tips the ice cream all over her, surely for the fun of it. And the woman in bed wakes up screaming in apparent, apparent anguish and terror. Uh, the man asks her what's wrong, and she replies, rather bemused, I fell asleep on both my arms. So these are neither mothers nor lovers. But actually, although this seems to set up a kind of dichotomy between Bonds and Killing Eve, both of these spy stories, I'm arguing, uh, belong to much older traditions in spy fiction that stretch back over the last century or so. So there are five parts to the talk today. First of all, I'm going to propose these two models of spy fiction and then look at the ways in which they affect plot, character, perspective, crucially, and also how setting actually indicates some crucial differences between the works. <clears throat> so part one, two models of spy fiction and why they matter. One of the first examples uh, of spy fiction, one of the uh, best known first examples, is Erskine Childers' The Riddle of the Sands from 1903. And this uh, was followed by another classic in 1915, John Buchan's The 39 Steps. Both of these um, really pave the way for Ian Fleming. They set up lots of tropes that then are made uh, classic in, in the Bond novels and later films. These all belong to what I call the male action model. It really does what it says on the tin. Um, but the characters we see in Childers and Buchan actually act as prototypes for Bond. So they're, as I mentioned earlier, wealthy, highly educated young men, typically white straight men as well. Um, they don't have any family ties. I say no vulnerabilities. I'd say fewer vulnerabilities is probably more accurate. So you don't have uh, family figures or loved ones you can bump off or take hostage or whatever. And all of them basically find normal life rather boring. The works typically begin with some kind of unexpected event, so in TV speak, the inciting incident. Um, and in both Childers and Buchan, you have these kind of uh, wealthy young men bored of uh, the, the high society life afforded to uh, men of means in the early 20th century. But then some unexpected event occurs, and it takes them on a tale of secrecy, deception, danger, and ultimately, pretty much always, world-saving bravery. This is fundamentally different from another trend occurring in parallel. So this we can think of as beginning uh, around the time of Joseph Conrad's The Secret Agent. This work about terrorism, bombings, political intrigue actually made it one of the most cited works uh, in the media after 9-11, works of fiction, I should say, in the media post 9-11. And it certainly uh, has a very exciting premise. Um, Adolf Verloc, who is the secret agent of the title, um, 
is a seedy sex shop owner. He sells kind of dodgy pictures to a series of men in low hats who are you know, trying to hide their identities themselves. And he is um, asked by an unnamed embassy to carry out a huge act of terrorism, namely the bombing of the Greenwich Observatory. And in this trend, perhaps surprisingly, I'm arguing that uh, John le Carre's classic, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, also belongs. Um, so le Carre isn't necessarily, particularly at this point, thought of as a beacon of female emancipation, but he's actually paving the way for the pattern then followed by Killing Eve. All of these works belong to what I'm terming the seesaw model of spy fiction. So we don't simply have this kind of overarching tale of political intrigue, but we also have another story about personal relationships, and I'll uh, elaborate on that in a moment. <clears throat> you might be wondering, so what? Or you might be <laughs> gripped already, hopefully. Well, this matters because lots of people think of works like Killing Eve as significant precisely because they're breaking gender stereotypes, they're subverting uh, uh, kind of classic tropes of fiction and spy fiction specifically. But actually, um, there are far more intricate patterns at work that say a lot about our entertainment experience and ourselves, arguably. And these also affect plot character and perspective, so fundamental aspects of our entertainment experience. <clears throat> so part two, plot. Um, the critic Todorov suggested a distinction between the temporal drives of the whodunit and the thriller. Um, so where both of these uh, types of genre fiction might start with a crime, the whodunit effectively goes backwards in time as we, the, the audience and the characters, wonder what happened before this point, how did we arrive at this crime? The thriller effectively does the opposite, it moves forwards and we move effectively in step with the characters as we question what is going to happen next. Most spy fiction actually might start like a little bit of a whodunit, so you might have an assassination or an attempted assassination or a bombing or whatever. So we do have that initial moment, whodunit, but then it switches very much into thriller as we move in step with the characters, wondering what's going to happen. <clears throat> but time in these works is actually, it's more complicated than that, and it's also, there is a distinction between the time of the male action story and the seesaw story. Um, so... Uh, it might, one obvious example between um, visual culture, so film and TV, and literature in terms of how time functions can be seen in the notion of the establishing shot. So those kind of scene setting moments where we have a sort of a, a lingering shot for a moment, uh, uh, just setting up the scene. In cinema, this will typically at most last for a few seconds, and if a director is actually trying to unnerve us, they might extend it for a little longer. But in literature, it can go on for <laughs> pages and pages. You might have a scene described at length. And so, and this, yeah, certainly gripped. Um, and so time already uh, uh, serves a very different function there. But... <clears throat> One thing I'm arguing is that in the male action story, we effectively have a kind of monodrive of time. So a sort of single linear story uh, moving in step with the characters. It begins with the inciting incident to kick things off. Um, and then we follow the hero's journey, their battles, the quest for the truth and you know, the discovery of the antagonist and so on. And pretty much always ends with the hero vanquishing the monster. But... Time also has kind of subtler subversions going on as well. Um, <clears throat> so Bond, I think, is a good example for this uh, in, in terms of cinema. Time can be accelerated. You might think that in the case of the screen, where we have dialogue and action and so on, time coincides fully for us in the seats of the audience. It's effectively real lifetime. But it, this isn't true. It's actually... Uh, manipulated to manipulate the audience experience as well. So this is a clip from Casino Royale. I hope the speakers are going to work, um, because <laughs> the main thing I want you to think about while watching this is actually the sound, what's going on with the sound. Bond is chasing a would-be bomber through Miami airport.
Yes. It's Bond. I need her now. I'm afraid she can't be disturbed. Can I take a message? Listen, you go and find her. Tell her to call security at Miami Airport because I think a bomb is about to go off and you do it now. Sorry, can I put you on hold? I thought you might. Bond? What the hell are you up to? I'll call you back. Um, classic M. Um, Bond exchange there. But what's interesting in terms of uh, the thematic focus of the scene is this idea of delay. So you've got the time of urgency in the airport, the bomber is you know, escaping uh, through the airport, um, and then this frustration of time, this bu bureaucratic time embodied by M. Um, Secretary back in London. Um, and that disjuncture actually gives us a, an increased sense of urgency. But also, I don't know if you could hear it on these, uh, well, my rather dodgy recording and the dodgy speakers, um, but the music in the background, there was this very quiet, percussive rhythm going on. Some people are nodding, that's good. Um, and it, it basically resembles the clicking of a, the, the ticking of a, a clock. Uh, in terms of the second hand, but it's accelerated. It's not going by at the pace of seconds. And this, of course, is also reminiscent of the, uh, the bomb ticking away. And so we have a sense there that time is actually moving at a, a faster velocity than real time. But bonds and also thrillers generally can also do the opposite. Um, so this is a, a clip from Goldfinger where bomb is trying to, bomb? Bond is trying to defuse a bomb. Um, and note in particular what's happening with the, the ticking bomb, the, the, the time on the, on the bomb here. Sorry. Is that 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, to 14 <laughs> and so on. So obviously we're being quite um, uh, clearly manipulated here. And what that does is delay the release. So it kind of builds up tension. We have a sense of time going quickly by, but we're not getting uh, the release of adrenaline um, uh, as fast as we should do in real lifetime. But this isn't just uh, a technique used in cinema. We also see it in other, of these, uh, other examples of these male action stories um, in the case of literature too. So this is um, an extract from John Buchan's The 39 Steps. And the hero, Richard Hannay, has just woken up from con concussion after an explosion, obviously. Um, and this is what he says. My stupor can have scarcely lasted beyond a few seconds, but I had no time to linger, since this mill was obviously a bad hiding place. Then I proceeded to go off into an old-fashioned swoon. I woke with a burning head and the sun glaring on my face. For a long time, I lay motionless. Sounds came to me from the house. For half an hour, they ransacked the mill. All that long, blistering afternoon, I lay baking on the rooftop. Ten minutes later, my face was in the spring, but I did not stop until I had put half a dozen miles between me and that accursed dwelling. So obviously I've omitted a lot here, there are a few ellipses, um, but what's really striking is just how many explicit temporal markers uh, Buchan uses here. So he mentions a few seconds, no time to linger, then a sudden change, uh, for a long time, for half an hour, all that long blistering afternoon, 10 minutes later, and then space, using, uh, space marking time with this putting uh, half a dozen miles between me and that dwelling. And it's such a rapid concertina of kind of short, a few seconds to all that long blistering afternoon. But he doesn't give any greater narrative weight. He doesn't spend any longer describing the, long, the length, larger lengths of time than the short ones. And in each case, too, he describes time in terms of action. He doesn't uh, give a moment uh, to reflect or talk about feelings or anything like that. It's just constant action. So Buchan described this novel as a shocker, and it really does uh, stretch the bounds of credulity most of the time. But what this gives us, uh, if we can actually kind of uh, 
pause for that moment of the willing uh, suspension of disbelief. Um, it, it gives us this, this hugely kind of thrilling sense of time that stuff is always happening. And this is really important in the male action stories. So <clears throat> going back to Bond, you very rarely have dialogue scenes that are simply dialogue scenes. Pretty much always something else is happening. So Bond might be extracting secrets from a spy while having sex with that spy, or beating you know, someone up, or doing a car chase or whatever. But games are also uh, really important in the Bond stories. Um, there are lots of examples uh, that may come to mind for you, but uh, Goldfinger, uh, the... the uh, a uh, game of golf with the notably phallic uh, golf clubs, octopusy, uh, backgammon, casino royale, poker, and so on. Um, these serve multiple functions. They don't just give us this kind of uh, sense that time never really stops in Bond. It's always something happening. But also, they paint these mini character portraits. So they show, yet again, Bond is unremittingly good. He's incredibly skillful. He plays by the rules. He's also a good loser when, uh, uh, if he ever does lose. And the baddies, the bad guys, are unremittingly bad. They're ruthless. They cheat. They lie. They often poison Bonds to get him out of the way. Um, <clears throat> and this also gives us, basically, the plot in miniature. It is a fight between good and evil. And this means, too, that we have a mini suspense hurdle. We effectively want to know who's going to win the game in the next few minutes. And this gives us uh, a hint about who's going to win the overall spy game as well. This is all fundamentally different from the seesaw spy stories. So in these stories, you have talking purely for talking's sake. They're not necessarily doing other activities at the same time. In The Secret Agents, next to uh, Adolf Furlock's uh, shop, um, is this, this isn't actually a picture uh, to do with The Secret Agent, but I thought it was quite a nice picture of a 19th century parlor that I, I think evokes that scene. There are lots of scenes in this parlor where anarchists are talking or Verloc and his wife have key conversations and so on, and indeed certain notable crimes are committed there. John Le Carre is a veritable master of these atmospheric uh, dialogue scenes. Um, and indeed, Alec Guinness's eyebrows often say a lot more than words. Um, so Smiley's People, the, the mini-series, uh, uh, Smiley's People, Tinker Taylor, and so on, uh, they have these dialogue scenes where nothing else is happening. People are purely talking. And this is one of the things that's so appealing and charming and funny about Killing Eve as well. Um, so Eve and Villanelle, the protagonist and the antagonist, in some sense, arguably, um, they first meet knowingly simply over some microwaved shepherd's pie at uh, the kitchen table. What this does is give these stories space to breathe. You kind of have a slower moment where you can take stuff in. It's not purely action all the time. But if you think back to that uh, arrow I, I showed about the male action story, the seesaw story is also fundamentally different because they have parallel plots. Yes, you have the A story, the big uh, tale of espionage and uh, kind of political ideologies or national conflict, but you also have B stories, <clears throat> personal relationships, which very rarely occur to any notable degree in the male action stories. So the questions we might uh, ask here are, who is the assassin? Who are they working for? Uh, which side will win? And what will happen to the hero specifically? We're invested in them as a character. Whereas in the B stories, we, they're kind of more banal questions in a sense. Who loves whom? Who knows what about these other relationships or affairs or um, uh, interests? Um, and who will end up getting with whichever other character? In all of these cases about the stories I mentioned here in the seesaw model, uh, there's another noticeable change, which is that the A story and the B story switch places. So lots of creative writing books would actually argue that this is a failure to manage the threads, that you really need to keep the A story prioritized. But in all of the cases, the B story becomes uh, paramount. And these personal tensions also complicate uh, the professional lives of the uh, spies and agents. So in The Secret Agent, how could Adolf Verloc possibly tell his wife what he has done and with whom? Hopefully that's not a significant spoiler. Um, what would Nam 
Perry in The Spy Who Came In From The Cold do if Alec Lemus told her what his job was, that he's a secret agent? And in Killing Eve, is Eve wrong to hide so much from her husband? Arguably, yes. Um, so these all complicate aspects of the main plot as well. And this brings me to uh, the discussion of character. So, Hercules versus Winnie the Pooh. This is uh, less uh, tongue-in-cheek than uh, it might sound, actually. Um, Bond, we can think of quite easily, I, 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 I suppose, as a, a, a modern mythological hero. Um, so, of course, his strength and his wit repeatedly enable him to vanquish the monster, and it is generally a kind of monster of almost mythical proportions, the bad guys. Um, he's also a master of disguise, a master of foreign languages. Um, and like Odysseus in particular, he travels the world, uh, sees the shade of his mother, at least in Judy Dench's portrayal of M. But in any case, M, it's kind of, you know, and I think the lang languages the world over, M is typically the... Uh, the sound of um, uh, maternal epithets. Um, and ultimately, he returns to his Penelope, uh, whoever the Bond girl is of the moment. Um, <clears throat> but this isn't new. This, the, these kind of mythological allusions are not unique to Bond. Um, we see this, too, in The 39 Steps, which echoes Daedalus's labyrinth. So the, the, the Scottish landscape is labyrinthine. The bad guys, the adversary, um, is again sort of this monstrous figure. And the uh, hero has to overcome both. And the allusions are made explicit in the Riddle of the Sands, not only in the echo of the Riddle of the Sphinx, but also the narrator Carruthers notes what a race it was, Homeric in effect, a struggle of men with gods, for what were the gods but forces of nature personified? If the god of the falling tide did not figure in the Olympian circle, he is nonetheless a mighty divinity. Um, that Egyptian sphinx actually <laughs> is perhaps less appropriate uh, than it might be, because one of the uh, aspects of these spy stories also is the, the, the mythological illusions of the sea. This looks a bit too hot and sandy there. Um, and the sea, of course, is important in lots of Bond stories. So Thunderball and The Spy Who Loved Me are largely set in or around water. You have these iconic Bond girls rising from the water like mermaids. And uh, Daniel Craig has also begun to toy with this merman figure. But the mythological uh, hero aspects go deeper than this. Um, <clears throat> most or many mythological heroes also have kind of toys or metonyms of their power. Um, so here, I mean, Poseidon and um, his trident, uh, Hermes and the winged sandals, Zeus and his thunderbolt, often uh, phallic in shape, um, and symbols of their potency. And this is, of course, a hallmark of Bond, all of his gadgets and gizmos. It's actually quite hard to find pictures of Bond's gadgets because it's, it's all kind of advertising watches and things. So these are a f only a few that I could actually find. Um, but again, this isn't new for Bond. The Riddle of the Sands already sets up these kind of relationships with, uh, between men and gadgets. Um, so Davies, the, the friend of the narrator, actually asks him for a long list of specialised equipment to come out and join him on this, this uh, what turns out to be a kind of secret quest, um, uh, fighting a, a, a German threat. Um, and the, the kind of the boredom and the weariness in the, uh, that Carruthers senses with this long list of equipment really anticipates, I think, uh, Bond's relationship with Q in this kind of, yeah, OK, we've got to go through all the gadgets again. But also, the men's relationship with their boat, uh, the docibella, um, the roughly translated as sweet beauty, couldn't be more erotic or kind of romantic, a, a name to give a boat. Of course, the boat is a she, but Carruthers also describes her as rolling drowsily, bowing a lingering farewell and that, that kind of thing. They personify the boat in this really quite loving and affectionate way, whereas they show a profound inability to talk about uh, actual real human women um, that they, uh, at least Davies is interested in. And this really anticipates Bond's uh, erotic relationship with his cars, which are sensuously enjoyed mainly for a short moment, and then kind of they're expendable like his lovers. And this is different 
from the flawed heroes that we see in the seesaw stories. Um, so this is a kind of hero type or a character type uh, frequently used in children's literature and Disney films, for example, because they're so likable and they're so human. Um, so this is uh, just a spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen Toy Story 1 and would still <laughs> like to see it. It's now on to Toy Story 4. Um, my son <laughs> is a bit obsessed with it, so this is for him. Um, basically, this arc I'm going to show you is common to children's literature generally. We have the likeable but flawed hero. They've got kind of human frailties, so we see ourselves in them. We get a glimpse of their everyday existence, their normal life and relationships. Then an unexpected event interrupts this everyday life. We then follow them on a tale of adventure. They experience some kind of growth and they return a little bit wiser um, back to the you know, family fold in some way. And it's this kind of character type that we see, not necessarily as happily, but um, in terms of character, throughout the seesaw spy stories. Um, so Winnie Verloc, perhaps more so than her husband, Adolf Verloc, certainly Alec Lemus uh, in The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, and Eve Pilastri of Killing Eve, they're all these kind of very human, flawed hero figures. You might be wondering, but what about Villanelle? <clears throat> Where does she come into this? You are right to wonder if you were. She is an exception. So <clears throat> she has, for example, a poisoned uh, hairpin. Don't know if you remember, she shoves this in someone's eye and poison perfume. And so she does have these kind of gadgets and gizmos, but they're repeatedly sexed up, feminized versions. So again, we get this sort of gendered nod and subversion, um, a nod to and a subversion of uh, James Bond. Like Bond, she also has a voracious sexual appetite and is uh, shown continuously with kind of changing lovers. She's a master of disguise. There's her as a sort of S&M nurse, a, a waitress, a gate crashing some random family party, um, and has an enviable uh, ability in foreign languages. Apparently, she, uh, she performed all of that phonetically and didn't know what she was saying, which I find <laughs> quite... Well, I don't know if that's disappointing or impressive, but... But she isn't James Bond. The two things that mark her out are, one, she's a psychopath, a known psychopath, and two, she falls in love. She has a monogamous erotic drive that lasts, well, for multiple seasons. <clears throat> so Hercules versus Winnie the Pooh. The male action stories act as a, a kind of modern myth with these godlike heroes demonstrating impossible feats and apparent invincibility, <coughs> whereas the seesaw stories are far more obviously grounded in a recognisable reality and have flawed humans at the centre. <clears throat> so this brings me on to section four on perspective. Much of spy fiction might seem to kind of resemble a really confusing game of chess. We don't necessarily uh, know fully what's going on, but pawns are being moved around a board um, in some kind of, uh, well, magical order. And it's also a hallmark of the genre gen generally um, that the characters themselves have a moment of realisation where they think they've been duped, they are just a pawn, they're not being seen as a human being, but they're being moved around on some game played by unseen forces. What this might suggest, or what we might expect from these stories, is that the male action model of spy fiction would prioritise a single point of view and set up this dichotomy between black and white morality, two sides um, in a game, and that the seesaw stories might vary and show us different perspectives. But actually, this isn't what we find at all. So James Bond, both in the Ian Fleming novels and the films, varies perspective. I think this is quite surprising. Um, and so, I mean, uh, uh, Rosa Klebb is, I think, quite an interesting example of this. We have an insight into uh, her background, her life, who she is as a character that Bond doesn't have. She's described as kind of unwomanly and ugly and all of the worst faults a woman in Bond could be. Um, and <clears throat> but what this does is actually deny us uh, moral 
uh, variability. So we're shown simply that the good guys have right on their side. They are still unmitigatedly good. And the bad guys, the, the foreign agents typically, are unremittingly bad. So they're shown to be sadistic, ruthless. They might you know, randomly kill an animal or whatever. They all typically have um, some kind of physical deformity to show how evil they are. Um, and the varying perspective simply serves to confirm this, so it doesn't give us any greater moral complexity. It also effectively ramps up narrative drive, so it gives us knowledge that Bond may not have, a moment of dramatic irony. We don't know, or rather we know, but Bond doesn't know, that Rosa Klebb is actually sending Tatiana as a honey trap for Bond, um, and so he walks right into this. The seesaw stories offer us a moral gray area. So Killing Eve is quite a straightforward example, uh, common to lots of TV shows, actually, uh, where you have insight into different perspectives, different characters, and you, you shift between uh, different points of view. But um, Joseph Conrad and John le Carré don't do it as straightforwardly. Joseph Conrad's um, The Secret Agent is based on a real-life event, or rather inspired by, um, so in February 1884, a young Frenchman, Marshal Baudin, was discovered with horrific injuries, but just about still alive, at the Greenwich Observatory in London, having apparently detonated a bomb. He lived for about half an hour uh, after he was found, um, but he and he could speak, but he refused to actually explain uh, his motives or what had happened. And uh, Joseph Conrad, in The Secret Agent, is imagining the possible circumstances surrounding this event. So he prioritises, in terms of narrative, the perspective of Adolf Verloc, but he also gives us insight into what's going on with the police detectives and, crucially, Verloc's wife, Winnie, um, who's a really fascinating figure, I think. And so what we have there is um, uh, increased moral complexity. We're shown different points of view. Interestingly, the spy who came from, in from the cold doesn't really do this. Um, it's largely told from the perspective of um, Alec Lemus, with occasional slippages that I think probably wouldn't be allowed by editors and stuff nowadays, but um, with very little variation. Um, but what we do have is variation in moral perspective. So we have the Western agent who uh, goes to the East, and then the communist in the West, and we have dialogues of battling ideologies and so on, which I think actually makes some of the most interesting parts of the uh, novel. <clears throat> so we might expect to see similar uses of narrative perspective in these, in these uh, kind of dichotomous plots, um, but they don't conform straightforwardly to particular styles. Uh, and yet they demonstrate these patterns in moral terms, so the one-sided view of the male action story versus the uh, complex uh, moral layers in the seesaw model. So <clears throat> Final part, setting. So how are these stories, how similar are these stories? Um, it might seem like I'm suggesting that all of these different works are basically telling the same story with the same characters over and over again in different guises. I'm not suggesting that at all. And in this final part, I just want to take a closer look at how scene is constructed, how space is constructed in the seesaw models, because this tells us a lot about how different they are. <clears throat> In uh, The Secret Agent, as I mentioned earlier, he's, uh, Adolf Verloc is tasked, well, he's called to this unnamed embassy, um, and he's on his way there in the opening of the novel. And this is what the narrator says. Mr. Verloc's whole person exhaled the charm of almost dewy freshness. He wore his blue cloth overcoat unbuttoned. His boots were shiny, his cheeks freshly shaven, had a sort of gloss and even his heavy-lidded eyes, refreshed by a night of peaceful slumber, sent out glances of comparative alertness. The narrator continues, a peculiarly London sun against which nothing could be said except that it looked bloodshot, glorified all this by its stare. It hung at a moderate elevation above Hyde Park Corner with an air of punctual and benign vigilance. 
So here the sun is bloodshot and this sets up an immediate contrast with the heavy lidded eyes refreshed by a night of peaceful slumber of Verloc. Their eyes are sort of entering into this gestural dialogue here. Um, Verloc is sending out glances and the sun stares. So that it's as though they're speaking to each other in some sense. The narrator continues that as Verloc surveys the people moving through the city with an approving eye, he reflects all these people had to be protected. And the sun, meanwhile, watches with this air of uh, punctual and benign vigilance. So what we're being told here via the narrator is that Verloc is seeing himself somehow on a par with the sun. He's also sort of hanging uh, uh, benignly and benevolently above London. He is all-seeing, he is all-powerful. This is setting up basically the attitude he has to carrying out this terrorist attack. The fact that he has sl he's slept well compared to the bloodshot um, sun is also soon to be punctuated by what he's going to be asked to do. But inserted in the middle of this is uh, the following description. Through the park railings, these glances beheld men and women riding in the row, couples cantering past harmoniously, others advancing sedately at a walk, solitary horsemen looking unsociable, and solitary women following, uh, followed at a long distance by a groom with a cockade to his hat and leather belt over his tight-fitting coat. Carriages went bowling by, mostly two horse browns, with here and there a Victoria with the skin of some wild beast inside and a woman's face and hat emerging above the folded hood. Um, one of the most noticeable things in this passage is the alliteration that Conrad uses, riding in the row, couples cantering, um, sedately, solitary, horsemen, sociable, solitary, uh, cockade, uh, coat, carriages, bowling by uh, Browns, and I think that's all I've highlighted there. Um, so what we have is a kind of percussive rhythm created with the little people in between. So you have this almost soaring duet between Verloc and the sun setting up this, this uh, gestural dialogue, and then this kind of percussive sound of the people. Um, so on, on the one hand, this certainly slows the pace. I think, as I mentioned earlier, this, it should be an incredibly exciting opening, a sex shop owner tasked with an act of terrorism and so on, but it's really quite hard work. I don't know if you uh, found that while reading this, but it's, it's quite hard to wade through this. But in terms of the sounds and images he sets up here, he's, he's creating a sense of Verloc's character, the way he views Londoners, the way he views other people, the way he views himself, that is telling us a lot about uh, uh, what is to come. It's anticipating um, the action and uh, his own character. This is totally different um, from John le Carre. I know this is a long pa uh, passage to read at this time of day. Um, but uh, I'm going to anyway. Um, this is the opening. So 1963, uh, the book came out. Uh, the Berlin Wall was newly erected. We're at Checkpoint Charlie. Lemus is contact in East Berlin. The double agent has been uncovered, um, exposed, uh, and is trying to escape across the border. Um, Lemus is waiting uh, at the border, uh, desperately hoping this agent is going to come. Lima said nothing, just stared through the window of the checkpoint along the empty street. You can't wait forever, sir. Maybe he'll come some other time. We can have the polizei contact the agency. You can be back here in 20 minutes. No, said Lemus. It's nearly dark now. Lemus walked to the observation window and stood between the two motionless policemen. Their binoculars were trained on the eastern checkpoint. He's waiting for the dark, Lemus muttered. I know he is. A bell rang inside the hut. They waited, suddenly alert. A policeman said in German, Black Opel Record, uh, Federal Registration. He can't see that far in the dusk, he's guessing. Shut up, said Lemus from the window. One of the policemen left the hut and walked to the sandbag and placement two feet short of the white demarcation, which lay across the road like the baseline of a tennis court. The other waited until his companion was crouched behind the telescope in the emplacement then put down his binoculars, took his black helmet from the peg by the door and carefully adjusted it on his head. Somewhere high above the checkpoint, the arc lights sprang to life, casting theatrical beams on the road in front of them. Le Carre here barely mentions space at all. It's such an evocative atmospheric location anyway. 
But <clears throat> all he does is basically mention the window, the empty street, it's nearly dark now, the observation window, the two motionless policemen, the sandbag emplacement, two feet short of the white demarcation, the peg by the door, and the arc lights. So a very sparse, okay, that looks like quite a lot when I say he doesn't mention it at all. He mentions it, but uh, they're very sparse descriptions. In fact, they're not descriptions. In each of these cases, there's some kind of verbal action attach, at, attached to them. So Lemus is staring through the window along the empty street. He says it's nearly dark now. He walks to the observation window and so on. There's some kind of action attached to them. So unlike Joseph Conrad sort of slowing the pace with this laborious scene setting, which is doing so much more than setting the scene, Le Carre keeps us going. It's incredibly uh, exciting to read from the word go. <clears throat> Oh, these are the verbs attached. <laughs> I'll just highlight those. Um, <coughs> noticeably, too, there are only two colours mentioned in the scene, the white demarcation and the black helmet. So it's almost as though we're reading the book in kind of black and white cinema, even though it's uh, literature. And there's something uh, interesting about these as well. The baseline of a tennis court and the arc lights casting theatrical beams onto the road in front of them. Um, interestingly, out of all of these uh, writers I've mentioned, John le Carre is the one who had to most vociferously um, defend himself against claims uh, of too much autobiography, basically, that he was writing from personal experience as a spy, and he um, had to insist this is all a work of fiction. Um, but what he's showing here in this really exciting opening, is that in some sense it's like a game or a theatre. Um, this, this kind of spy, uh, the spy game, the tale of espionage that we're in. So we have there two very different uh, constructions of space that tell us a lot about character and why it is that we find some harder to read than others. Killing Eve, when people uh, think about the colour or the costume or, or uh, sort of the setup of Killing Eve, people often think about Villanelle's uh, evocative clothing. And so, the, I mean, the iconic pink fluffy dress and then these uh, bizarrely well fitting boys' pajamas that she steals in <laughs> season two um, and looks so good. Um, but actually, again, there's a lot more going on beneath the surface here. So in the traditional um, artist colour wheel, uh, it's always it's pleasing for the eye, uh, pleasing for the mind to use complementary colours. And um, indeed, Van Gogh favoured uh, blue and orange, and so does Killing Eve. Um, so in almost any scene you pick out in Killing Eve, you have these kind of these blues and browns. And in some ways, I think they're, they're also referencing the kind of... Um, uh, the John le Carre miniseries and things like that, where you have these, these pastel hues. Um, but frequently, Eve herself is pictured in kind of darker shades and uh, Villanelle in sort of uh, the softer colours. Um, so later in the series, Villanelle starts wearing her provocative outfits. Um, but initially, we're being told a lot about their character and relationship. So where Eve might wear a dark blue, Villanelle will be pictured in a sort of softer, feminine, more childish baby blue, where Eve wears a kind of brown colour, uh, Villanelle's, if you can see it on this quality, um, is a sort of warmer, softer colour. This scene is the first time um, Eve and Villanelle actually meet each other, even though they don't yet realise who the other one is. Um, and just as you watch this, think about the colour and what it's saying about the characters and their relationship. <laughs> Are you all right? Wear it down. Mm. 
I can't help but think she didn't wash her hands there, but um, I mean, that's, that's particularly as a nurse, and she's pretending to be a nurse there. Um, she's actually on a kind of mass killing spree at that moment. Um, so it's thoroughly disturbing. Um, well, anyway, as you will have uh, no doubt have noticed, um, the only colours there are this kind of pale beige and blue, the only colours in the room at all in the toilet, even on the posters, uh, the walls and everything like that. And these are the colours that Villanelle and Eve are wearing. And so we have this sparseness, but also a sense of uh, uh, the ways in which they complement each other. They, they contrast, but they go together. And the space is all about them. They really kind of... They make it all about them. We're transfixed on these figures. But although they seem to be kind of contrasting aspects of one whole, they're fundamentally different too. Um, so Villanelle, in the first episode alone, uh, travels to Vienna, Tuscany, Paris, I think London as well. And we have these, again, typical of spy fiction, these kind of uh, big... Um, titles showing us that we're doing this kind of globe-trotting thing around the characters. <clears throat> She's also shown uh, on a kind of lots of different forms of transport and mobility, the Paris metro, um, in a cafe in Vienna, walking through stylish streets, uh, on a motorbike, scaling tall buildings. You know, th she is a mobile figure who has power over her surroundings. She's got the power to roam, tip typically kind of male prerogative in spy fiction. And as well, I mentioned earlier, a range of lovers. Contrast this with Eve. Um, she's shown in uh, meeting rooms, her office, waiting rooms, interrogation rooms in bed not having sex with her overtired husband, and even on the loo. So she basically um, lives in a much smaller kind of world, always waiting, always not doing something. And again, if you just recall the previous slide, the colour is sucked out of uh, moments with Eve. Um, I mean, my favourite instance of this is uh, the kitchen. It's actively draining to look at this scene. Um, <clears throat> it looks, you know, thoroughly depressing. Um, and so this tells us a lot about how different these characters are, or rather these complementary characters, how different their lives are and why Eve might be so drawn to someone like Villanelle. <clears throat> So what these behind, what we're basically looking at um, scene setting does is take us behind the scenes. Um, and this shows us a lot of the tricks that are going on in uh, literature and TV. And even the subtle manipulations of language or colour or costume or sound is a, is a very big one in Killing Eve. As music is typically playing when uh, Villanelle is on the scene, uh, but not for Eve, again, showing more vibrancy in her life. These all affect how we see character and story. And what it does is basically give us a sense of familiarity with characters that we've effectively only just met. And this makes us invested in the story that we're about to uh, uh, continue on. <clears throat> so, the fantasy or the mirror. Why do we care, going back to my opening question, the male action stories effectively offer an escapist fantasy. This is uh, who we might like to be if we're already a straight white man um, and are interested in all of the things that Bond offers. Um, the seesaw stories offer an adventurous <coughs> mirror. So effectively, they hold up a mirror to ourselves and our own lives, who we are already, plus a thrilling adventure that we can imagine ourselves going on. <clears throat> so as Maria mentioned, I'm writing a book um, entitled From King Lear to Killing Eve, Why We Love the Stories We Do, and this is one of the chapters from it. And in this, I'm comparing popular contemporary culture with classic works of literature, uh, basically questioning why uh, is it that we care more about the story or the packaging? Um, and to do this, I'm looking at patterns that recur across works across the ages and also how things changed, be they ideas or forms or themes. Um, if you'd like to read more about this project, um, I've written a few articles for The Independent on it already, uh, or uh, I'm not a, an avid tweeter, but if you follow me on Twitter, um, I occasionally update things there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>